Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You are all welcome to today's webinar put together by Bloom Public Health and Make Life Sciences. Today, we're looking at a topic on primary and secondary standards for pharmaceutical analysis. And to take us to, to today's training is Dr. Ilona Smatu. Dr. Ilona Smatu. Dr. Ilona Smatu is currently in the Analytical Sciences Expert Group in Met Life Sciences. She has almost 20 years experience with the products and techniques for instrumental and classical chemical analysis. She works closely together with the product managers, R&D, and application labs for reference materials for high purity reagents for filtration products and for different chromatography techniques. Dr. Elona has an MBA and promotion in pharmaceutical chemistry and has more than 10 years experience from the R&D laboratory in uh, Gideon Richard Pharma PLC. Dr. Elona Smatus, you're welcome to today's program. Thank you. And my co-moderator in today's program is Mr. Stanley Imadujemu. Mr. Stanley Imadujemu, you're welcome. And Thank you very much. Yeah, in today's presentation, we are going to be able to see the quality pyramid, the primary reference materials, use of secondary reference materials according to pharmacopoeia, qualification of secondary reference materials in pharmaceutical analysis. And I'm sure this is also applicable. We find it useful in any of analytical laboratory work and as usual our housekeeping rules are still applied and the chat box is disabled as we know to enable optimal concentration questions can be posted in the course of presentation in the question and answer chat box all questions will be answered at the end of the presentation except for want of time when unanswered questions will be addressed and forwarded to the email address you registered with. So you're welcome to today's webinar. And at the end of the presentation, we are going to have a short video clip um, from Bloom Public Health and also from MEC, just to let you know what we stand for and the vision of these two companies collaborating together. You're welcome. Dr. Ilonas, please, you have the floor. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank you for your very kind words and for the introduction. And also, I would like to thank you for this possibility to talk to you uh, today. I will switch off my video. Just wanted to say hi to everyone because I'm a little bit afraid that the quality will not be as good if I stay with the video. So. Uh, I will talk to you about uh, pharmaceutical standard, primary and secondary standards. And uh, um, I would like to um, welcome you or say you um, a big thank you for participating in this presentation and for the possibility to, uh, to present you this topic. First of all, we will have a look uh, at the hierarchy of certified reference materials, then uh, have a short look about the traceability of secondary standards as working standards, what does it mean? Then I will explain you how we are doing the certificate of analysis and characterization of our pharmaceutical secondary standards. And at the end, we will have some slides about uh, our impurity portfolios and what it means these uh, mix uh, CRMs what we have. So the hierarchy of certified reference materials. Um, whatever you are doing in the analysis, are you doing a qualitative or a quantitative analysis? In all cases, you will need something to compare your sample with. So you, you are always comparing to a known something, and this known something is the reference material. If you are doing qualitative analysis, it can be an identification or just the presence or absence uh, look at your uh, sample. 
And if you are doing quantitative analysis, you can look for the amount of uh, the content, contained uh, compound, or you can uh, look for, for some limit tests, for cutoff, uh, for the presence of material, and you want to have uh, this measurement in a way which is comparable to other laboratories. So what does testing mean? It means safety for our life, for our health, integrity, strength, purity, and quality to all things what we are using. If we um, visualize this uh, system or, or these um, uh, different types of uh, materials, what we can use a standard or to compare to, we can start with the so-called reagent grade or research chemicals. They are just normal chemicals which may or may not come with a certificate of analysis and they are absolutely not characterized for use as reference materials. Sometimes is, if there is nothing else available, you would use that, but that we wouldn't really call as reference materials. If we step further back uh, up on the pyramide, the level of certification and traceability is increasing. Uh, the next step I would say would be the analytical standard. These are already standards which are produced under ISO 9001 um, environment. And the, normally a certificate of analysis is available, but the level of certification is really very different from material to material to uh, uh, from company to company. So there is nothing uh, defined or, or uh, uh, pre-described. If we are talking about reference materials or certified reference materials, these products have to be produced already by a company or institution which is uh, certified according to ISO 17034. And uh, for the quality um, control uh, for CRMs, you need the 17025 uh, ISO certification. So these um, um, materials, reference materials and CRMs are already manufactured by an accredited reference material producer. CRMs are considered to provide the highest level of accuracy, uncertainty and traceability to an SI unit of measurement. And on the top of the pyramid, we have uh, the National Metrology Institutes or the Compendial Authorities Institutes, which are producing the primary standard, which are um, absolutely the highest level uh, of, of uh, standards, what you can have, and uh, they have the highest level of accuracy and traceability. These are always issued by an authorized body. And uh, for the basis of, of the, the basis of for that is the so-called SI system. What most probably all of you know, these uh, it has seven units, which are the basic units, which uh, uh, all these metrology system is built on. Of course, for us, for uh, reference materials, especially the kilogram is very uh, important and the molarity. Uh, this is what we use usually for uh, the the chemicals. So um, if we um, are looking at the reference materials produced by the authorities, these authorized standards, uh, we have two types. It can be produced by um, um, institution or it can be produced by uh, a national pharmacopoe. So a primary standard in a metrology is a standard that is designated or widely acknowledged as having the highest metrological qualities 
and whose value is accepted without reference to other standards of the same quantity within a specified context. And uh, the certificates provide the property value associated uncertainty and methodological traceability to the SI units as mentioned. Here are some examples. Uh, it can come from National Institute of Standards and Technology or any other national institution. The compendial primary standards in pharmaceutical setting, the primary or compendial standard is one having the highest metrological qualities whose value is accepted without reference comparison to another standard. And uh, it certificates approved content of this material. It can be provided uh, like from the USP, in the US, the US Pharmacopeia, or the European EDQM, or any other pharmacopeia uh, in the countries. So, as I mentioned, the highest uh, level is provided by these um, author uh, authorized bodies, and the validity of using primary standards will never be questioned. immediately recognized by auditors. Uh, and they can be used, of course, also to qualify other standards for the next steps. Primary standards are, are designed to be used with the monographs. So if you are talking about uh, the pharma world, pharma environment, the primary standards, they are always coupled to a monograph, perform exactly as expected since they were designed according to the monograph. And they can be used in any analytical or laboratory use as specified by the compendia. So there is never a question mark for that. And uh, these primary standards may be what is required for your specific application. Um, it is very often written in the laboratories, SOPs, that primary standards have to be used for different purposes. And if it is like that, then you have to use them. So now coming to the topic of uh, the presentation to the secondary standards. What are these so-called secondary standards? They are certified reference materials, CRMs, that are traceable to these primary standards, what we discussed in the previous uh, slides. And uh, they can be traceable to pharmaceutical and also to NMI standards, to the SI units. So they are considered to provide the highest level of accuracy, uncertainty, and traceability. And uh, they are always produced by an accredited reference material producer. And basically, they are just one step um, to the primary standard and always traceable to that. These analytical standards can be used for a variety of method verification practices. It includes instrument qualification and calibration, analytical method validation, and system suitability testing assays or quality control checks, but again, depending on the SOPs in the laboratory. So it depends a little bit also on you, how you define your processes. If you want to have a look at that from a little bit different view, taking this flowchart, on the top of the flowchart are the primary standards, which are um, provided by the pharmacopoeias. And then from these primary standards, um, in-house working standards are produced or working standard solutions are produced. And on the same way, the next step, uh, we produce the pharma secondary standards or our CRM mixtures, which are directly uh, coupled to the primary standards. So this is just the next step. 
do these uh, secondary standards, in-house standards have a validity for sure. If you have a look at the FDA uh, guidance for industry, it says a reference standard, primary standard may be obtained from the USP and F or other official sources. A working standard like in-house or secondary standard is a standard that is qualified against and used instead of the reference standard. So uh, FDA knows these kind of standards and allows it to use to be used in certain uh, situations. If you have a look at the USP, it says that uh, such strategies and practices can include the use of secondary standards traceable to the USP reference standard to supplement or support any testing undertaken for the purpose of conclusively demonstrating conformance to applicable compendia standards. So also the USP, uh, General Chapter 1010 knows and allows the use of secondary standards. And uh, finally, if we have a look at the European Pharmacopoe, the secondary standard, a standard established by comparison with a primary standard. A secondary standard may be used for routine quality control purposes for any of these uses described above for primary standards, provided that it is established with reference to the primary standard. And this is what we do with our secondary standards. So just uh, a summary, again on the right, you see this pyramide and um, on the top of the pyramide, you have uh, the compendia standard and just next the certified reference materials. And if you look at the checkbooks, you see for CRMs, we, have the purity, identity, content, stability, homogeneity, uncertainty, and traceability proofs. So uh, they are in uh, several cases um, just next to the primary standard and possible to use. So what does it mean traceability of secondary standards as working standard? Here you can see an example of a comprehensive certificate of analysis, what we deliver with our secondary um, reference materials. This example is the chloroquine phosphate. I think we all heard about that in the last months, unfortunately a lot about it. Um, we took it as an example. Normally, the certificate of analysis for this um, secondary standards is about five to seven pages because it describes all analytical parameters used in certified mass balance value and assay values. So in, in the next slides, I will show you um, in detail what we have on the certificate of analysis and you will see that you get a lot of data with uh, this certificate. First of all, here you see the certified value. The certified value is uh, on a mass balance basis and uh, the certified value is connected to the SI system and um, the certified value is uh, with associated uncertainty because we have all um, the requirements for that. Uh, we will go into details um, just in the next slides. But we have also the traceable assay value. The traceable SO, assay value is a comparative SO, assay value which uh, demonstrates direct traceability to a pharmacopoeia standard. In these um, uh, case, it was the USP lot R075SO and um, the SA value, what we got in comparison to that, we, it was 99.6%. Um, so you have both uh, 
kind of, of traceability, as you can see, uh, one based on the mass balance method to the SI system and another one um, to, to the pharmacopoeia standard, and that is usually based on chromatography, but also that is included in the certificate of analysis. So we have traceability in two ways, like uh, we take these example, the amlodipine related compound C, or uh, in other pharmacopoeias, it's uh, mentioned as impurity G. Uh, in one direction, you can have a certified purity uh, based on the mass balance method and uh, traceable to the SI units. And in the other direction, you have the traceability assay where uh, we, we have the traceability to the USP and also to the EP. In this case, you have also the batch number and all the data, what is necessary to identify which USP standard was used. So if we have a, a look how exactly is multiple techniques for chromatographic purity and residuals. Um, the assay can be not only chromatography, it can be also titration. Um, but titration is very often replaced now by chromatography if possible because uh, it's a bit less selective sometimes. And then, of course, the traceable, traceability to compendial primary standards is normally or usually a chromatographic assay. So how uh, would the mass balance method work? The certified purity is determined uh, in the mass uh, balance method uh, by a calculation. You take the 100% and basically subtract all the other components which might be present as impurities. Uh, it's like the ROI, residue on ignition. This is normally the inorganic part of uh, the impurities. Then you have, uh, you can have water which is determined by loss of drying or Carr-Fisher titration. And then you have residual solvents, which can be present from the process of um, um, production or, or any other way. And finally, the total chromatographic impurities, which is mainly the organic impurities, what you can find in your uh, material eventually. So this is what we have to look at to uh, to define the purity of our material. On the next slides, what you see in this blue bracket or blue part, this is always, um, this can be found on the certificate of analysis. We take as example the adrenaline hydrochloride uh, PHR 2478, and uh, these are excerpts from the certificate of analysis of this compound. So the first part is the residue analysis, uh, residue on ignition. The method is the so-called sulfated ash method, where basically the organic part is burned off and uh, uh, the remaining inorganics are measured. Mean of three measurements was 
for 6%. So this is the residue on ignition contribution um, to, to the mass balance uh, impurities. You can do also measurements with ICP-MS alternatively or ion chromatography. In this case, we use the sulfated ash. The next, on the next slide, um, the water content is demonstrated. So as I mentioned, you can uh, do um, with a, a balance and an oven, a loss, on, a loss on drying, or you can do a titration here. We did a Carl Fisher titration, and after three measurements, we found that the water content was 0.0097%, and this will be the contribution uh, to the impurities of water. On the next slide, um, we are looking for the residual solvents. There is a USP method uh, 467, and this was adapted to adrenaline hydrochloride to determine the residual solvent content. And all this, what you see here, you can find also on the certificate of analysis. So uh, how it was done, uh, which column, carrier gas, flow, split ratio, injection temperature, and so on, all this is um, documented there. As you can see here, we didn't uh, get in the limit of, of the uh, measurement, we didn't get any, uh, we couldn't find any solvent, so the contribution will be zero per percent. And finally, the um, chromatographic impurities for um, the organic impurities, we are looking uh, for. Um, with the chromatography method, what you can see here. Um, the column is mentioned, the mobile phase, the mobile phase ratio, and so on. So all the um, measurement conditions you can find on the certificate of analysis. And uh, that's an advantage for the user because anytime if you want to check it or, or um, do a similar measurement, you can do that based on this data. Here we found two peaks. Uh, in total, they have an 0.169% contribution uh, to the mass balance impurities of the material. So finally, we can put it all together to determine the purity assignment for adrenal adrenaline hydrochloride. We just went through how the contributions for um, ROI, um, water, residual solvents, and chromatographic impurities were determined. And now we can insert these um, individual contributions into the mass balance equation and determine the purity or potency value based on that. The number highlighted in, in yellow um, is the certified mass balance that is shown on the front page of the certificate of analysis where we started uh, at the beginning of this section. Number or the plus or minus value next to the purity value. The uncertainty of the CRM is the sum of the squares for the following source of uncertainty. The uncertainty of the characterizations, the uncertainty is related to possible between battle variation, you see UBB. And the uncertainty is due to long-term and uh, short-term storage. So the uncertainty of the characterization considers the uncertainties due to characterization of the material. 
there is an associated uncertainty in each measurement that is taken for the mass balance. It is in this term that the method uncertainties for both the residue and TCI are represented. Uh, the next one is the between bottle variation. It cannot be assumed that each unit in a manufactured batch is identical. It must be demonstrated that the first of a batch is the same as the middle and the late parts of a batch. Certified reference materials are tested for homogeneity where multiple units in the early, middle, and late portions of a manufactured batch are measured for homogeneity. Here in these excerpts, uh, what you see in blue from a certificate of analysis, you can see that the homogeneity was considering using an HPSC method where the sample size was 50 milligram. So, and finally, uh, the last uncertainty terms come from long-term and short-term stability factors. Short-term stability is evaluated to ensure that degradation doesn't occur during transport, while long-term stability is evaluated to ensure that degradation doesn't occur during long-term storage. These are only past fair values and most of the time no contribution for uncertainty is included. And then we have um, the expanded uncertainty with key the coverage factor. For ideal population, the coverage factor is two. It assumes a confidence interval of 95% or two standard deviation. So this is what you see in um, the brackets or, or after the value uh, now marked with uh, yellow, the expanded uncertainty. So this is how you get this part of, of the number. Now, after uh, having a look how we relate to the SI units and um, how we get these uh, values, uh, now we uh, have a look how secondary standards are traceable to the pharmacopoeia. The secondary pharma standards are traceable to the compendium monograph. Here you see uh, for ibuprofen an EP monograph and the USP monograph. But uh, the secondary standards are also traceable to USP, EP, BP. It depends on uh, what is available and how it was qualified uh, to these primary reference standards. So the secondary standards are traceable to the compendia standards in multiple ways. First off, the methods on the certificate of analysis ref reference the compendia monograph. Analytical conditions called out in the monograph are used to qualify them. Here is a representative um, NIAS a cinamide chromatogram that was run using conditions as specified in the monograph. Here you can see all the data also on the certificate of analysis. We copied it just here to the slide. Additionally, content is assigned through comparative assay to compendial standards. In this case, content has been assigned against the current lots of the USP EPBP standards, as you can see there on the slide. When new lots are released by the pharmacopoeia, secondary standards are recertified against the new primary standard, and the updated certificate of analysis is available online. You can download it uh, from our website using the product number of uh, the standard and the batch number of the standard. So this is why we recommend to download always the late, latest versions. When monographs are available, pharma secondary standards are qualified using the compendial monograph methods and head to the requirements of that method. 
This is a chromatogram of the system suitability injection for PHR1258 chloroquine phosphate. Per USP monograph, the system suitability was required to have phenol, RCG, R related compound D, hydroxychloroquine sulfate, RCA, the EPI. Here you can see that and upon qualification of the pharmaceutical secondary standard, these system suitability requirements were evaluated uh, by us and met. So we could use this method for the qualification. But uh, it's not necessarily always uh, chromatography, also other types of assays can be performed. For example, content can be assigned by titration. Here is an excerpt from the secondary standard uh, certificate of analysis for sodium acetate uh, trihydrate, the material using per perchloric acid and uh, the uncertainty has been assigned. In this case, you have uh, two certified values and uh, one is by titration, the other one is based on the mass balance. And the great thing is that the user can pick which value is appropriate. So for example, if you are using the secondary standard for a titration application, then the certified value by titration may be more appropriate than the mass balance. Also, content can be assigned by UV in some monographs, as you can see here, um, at 375 nanometers. Um, so that is also possible. The USP monograph was followed also here. Further traceability to the primary standard includes the FTIR comparison for identification. Here you have uh, the secondary standard compared to the current BP, USP, and EP batch. The spectra are stacked in the certificate of analysis so that comparison can be very easily made. <laughs> Sometimes um, it is the case where compendial standards don't have a monograph available. For example, related compounds and impurities will most likely not have dedicated compendial monographs available. It is the case for flunixin R related compound B that there is no monograph for the assay of this standard. In cases like these, new methods must be developed for the assay and chromatographic purity assignment. Sometimes it is the case that API monographs can be used for uh, the development, but sometimes new de newly developed methods are required due to the properties of analyte on hand. In this case, a new method for flunixin RCB needed to be considered as the API compendial monograph for flunixin was not appropriate for the related compound. If you have a look at the compound, you can see that the related compound B is much smaller and more polar than the API. In situations like these, new methods are developed and validated. In these cases, a different type of selectivity was employed. An F5 column, much more suitable for more polar molecules, was used instead of the C18, which is used for the assay. You can have uh, a look at the chromatographic conditions uh, we, we have that also on the certificate of analysis. Resolution against the API and other related components is uh, demonstrate, demonstrated in the chromatogram and also high range linearity for the assay assignment and low range li linearity for impurity assignment uh, was evaluated. Whatever we are doing, method validation is always, uh, uh, for a new method is always 
um, including appropriate selectivity, peak shape, linearity, and RSD as usual. It can be the case sometimes where no compendial monographs, uh, even in a pending form, are not uh, available, um, but compendial standards are available. This was the case for recently released uh, safinamide mesylate, which is a Parkinson's drug. A method was developed and validated to show selectivity between the EPI and uh, these three related compounds on the slide. As always, the method information is printed in the detailed certificate of analysis um, so that the end user can see what method was used to determine total chromatographic impurities. And now finally, uh, some words about possible mixes um, in the impurity portfolios and, and other complex mixtures. Multiple impurities can be associated with one EPI. For example, here you see um, the ibuprofen, um, PHI product list for impurity and related compounds. This is of course just a partial list of many compounds that have been identified as potential impurities for ibuprofen. Impurities can be identified by monographs, but also by industry or by other means. This list of around 20 analytes include compendia and non-compendia standards. The secondary standard, ibuprofen, is traceable to the USP, EP, and BP standards for ibuprofen. But take another example, ibuprofen B. This is traceable to the EP standard for impurity B because it's available. Sometimes it can be very challenging to find compendial standard for one of these impurities. As we move down the list, we come to standards such as ibuprofen impurity G that have been identified by a pharmacopoeia but don't have a compendial standard. Even though there is no compendial standard available, a secondary standard is available and the certified mass balance for this standard can be used for quantitation. And as we move down the list even further, you will find impurities listed that don't have a common name. These are ibuprofen impurities that have been identified as such outside of the pharmacopoeia setting. These are known ibuprofen impurities that have been identified by industry. The pharma secondary And these portfolios offer impurity standards that may not be available otherwise. Next, I would like to briefly touch on some mixtures that are already prepared in solution. In addition to the NEAT secondary standards, some EPIs and their related compounds are available as a premix solution standard. Premix solutions can save an extensive amount of sample prepar preparation time as these standards are ready to go. You don't have to weigh in, you don't have to dilute um, and so on, snap and shoot, just use them. For example, this standard includes acetaminophen and seven of its related compounds or impurities. These impurities are certified by mass balance and are traceable to the USP and EP by their original assay. These components are premixed in solution for day working standard use, so very convenient for you. And now coming to the wrap up, uh, I would like to summarize. So we were touching pharma secondary standards, uh, which are uh, certified reference materials. These um, certified reference materials are unique in that traceability is offered to both the current primary standard and to the SI 
unit through the mass balance approach. The detailed certificate of analysis is updated to the current lot of the primary standard. And the certificate of analysis offers enough detail so that the user can understand how it was qualified and which impurities are present. The portfolio is increasing and contains now about 1,500 products. Uh, so the best is really to check on our website the latest uh, list of products if you are interested in. And these catalog items include both compendial and non-compendial impurities. So I would like to say a big thank to our R&D colleagues and product management to help me to put this presentation together. And I would like to thank you for your attention and I hope you like this. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ilunas Matus was very exciting and um, we thank you for your time and for all the participants thank you for allowing us to come into your space and thank you for listening so before we go to the question and answer proper we're going to take a video clip for five minutes from bloom public health and also from MEC life sciences we want to show how Bloom Public Health is advancing pharmaceutical manufacturing in Africa, which is top priority for, for us at Bloom Public Health. And so we want to present to you Nigeria's premier pharmaceutical manufacturing pack in partnership with the Association of Industrial Pharmacists of Nigeria. Please take a look at this. Thank you. The availability of quality medicines is crucial to adequate healthcare delivery and paramount to achieving universal health coverage. In Nigeria, the collective output of locally manufactured pharmaceutical products meets just 25% of the total demand, while 75% of these needs are imported from other countries of the world. With the recent COVID-19 pandemic, Nigeria is exposed to shortages of essential medicines and this leads to a buildup of substandard medicines, high mortality rate and a decline in economic growth. To tackle these problems, Nigeria needs an enabling environment with adequate infrastructure, the presence of good road network, power, water and other amenities, research and development, a center of excellence where products and new molecules discovered can be developed and manufactured for local consumption and export. Medicine security. Establish a resilient supply chain providing standardized raw materials and finished products in country and ensuring decreased dependence on imports and susceptibility to substandard medicines. Best practice. Guaranteed quality of products by maintaining strict adherence to WHO, current good manufacturing practice, and other requisite international standards. We introduce PharmaCity. PharmaCity is Nigeria's first pharmaceutical industrial park, which has been conceived to tackle the existing challenges of infrastructure, high cost of manufacturing, and revolutionize indigenous drug manufacturing. PharmaCity is categorized into five zones, each complementing the other to create a humane industrial estate that maintains a balance between work, play, learning, and living. The industrial zone provides state-of-the-art facilities, including factories with access control for secure production, warehouse facilities for raw materials and finished products, as well as suitable warehousing facilities for non-manufacturers. The administrative blocks will provide service office spaces for regulatory agencies, including NAFDAQ, SON, DCN, and Nigeria Customs Service in Tampani Park. The Research and Development Center for Excellence will serve as a converging point for researchers from across the globe that will power innovation and excellence in the Nigerian pharmaceutical industry, opening up a new horizon and great opportunities. Next is the shared service zone, which will include a water treatment plant, an influence treatment plant, a power plant, and a waste management plant. Equipment within the shared zone will not only guarantee efficiency, but will drastically cut the cost of manufacturing for companies at the park by providing economies of scale. The Support Services Zone provides infrastructure and equipment to ensure a smooth running of the park and ensures products adhere to international good manufacturing practice. 
quality control block, equipment qualification and maintenance facilities. The training center will provide continuous professional capacity building for staff of companies at the park, research students and the general workforce, firefighting facility, petrol stations and banks. The residential zone offers high, medium and low income residential buildings, banks, hospitals, schools, restaurants and conference center. Finally, the recreational zone, a purpose-built green area for relaxation and fun. Based on research, a three-year data analysis of three companies shows an average of 13% net savings per annum if they were to be situated in the farmer city. Some of the innumerable benefits of the park include increased return on investment and wealth creation for all stakeholders, huge opportunities for employment, a faster regulatory approval process from agencies within the park, opportunities to export to other countries. Pharma City will catalyze inflow of foreign direct investments, technological and managerial know-how to the market. The long-term benefit to Nigeria is the achievement of a 50% reduction in imports and a 50% increase in export of medicines and other health products, the 50-50 objective. Pharma City will boost foreign exchange earnings and improve balance of trade for Nigeria. The recent global situation is more than a pandemic. It has brought the world to a halt. Nigeria, it is time to change the narrative and the time is now. For further inquiries, contact Bloom Public Health on Twitter handle and Facebook, Bloom Pub Health. Email pharmacity at bloompublichealth.com. Telephone 234-803-310-7793 or 234-803-265-4940. Bloom Public Health is the technical partner of the Association of Industrial Pharmacists of Nigeria, NAIP. And this is the future in Africa, and Bloom is driving this, the African Pharmaceutical Park. Thank you. Mr. Sanley, please can we have the clip from Mac? Thank you very much. So in Mac, we say welcome to the future. And, um, this is an overview of our headquarters in Darmstadt. Mac ranks among the world's leading pharmaceutical and chemical companies. Who we are. We are a vibrant science and technology company, and we have a rich history of over 350 years of curiosity. The company was um, started in 1668, making us the oldest pharmaceutical and chemical company in the world currently. Science is at the heart of everything we do, from advancing genome editing technologies and discovering unique ways to treat the most challenging diseases to enabling the intelligence of devices. So we can say MEC is everywhere. We have 56,000 employees worldwide and we are present in 66 countries. And as I said before, founded in 1668 with a net sales of 15.3 billion euros. And out of that, MEC invested 2.1 billion euros in R&D. That's to show you how research and development is very close to our hearts. We are known as MEC in all the other parts of the world, except in US and Canada, where we are regarded as EMD Serono, Melipo Sigma, and EMD Performance Materials for our different phases of business. What we do, uh, we are into healthcare, and this under this uh, pillar of our business, we manufacture prescription drugs and solutions to treat cancer, multiple sclerosis, infertility, cardiovascular, and metabolic diseases. And also we have over-the-counter products, uh, which we recently sold uh, to Procter & Gamble. And we also have products for allergic purposes. Then under the life science pillar, we have innovative tools and laboratory supplies for the life science industry that makes research and biotech production better, faster, and safer. And we have a broad in-depth portfolio of over 300,000 products, industry-leading e-commerce platform, which is sigmaalbrick.com, and an award-winning innovation. And under the performance material portfolio, we have a wide range of high-tech chemicals, such as liquid crystals and OLED materials for displays and lightning effect pigments for coatings and cosmetic products, specialty chemicals for the semiconductor industry, and functional materials for solar panels. We empower the scientific community. Our tools, services, and digital platform make research simpler and more exact and help to deliver breakthroughs more quickly. Our solutions accelerate access to health by ensuring that tests are accurate and the medicines we take 
can be trusted. Uh, curious minds dedicated to human progress are actually uh, those that work in MEG, a global network of scientists, experts, and thought leaders are driven by the passion to explore and the prospects of making a meaningful difference in the world. So we are MEG, and under the umbrella of MEG in the life science portfolio, we have products uh, ranging from the millicule lab water solutions to products in the millipore uh, uh, portfolio, which has to do with preparation, separation, filtration, and monitoring of products. Then Stigma Aldrich, lab and production materials. Under Superco, we have analytical products. And then the SCFC, which is the pharma and biopharma raw material solutions. And then also under bio reliance, we have pharma and biopharma manufacturing and testing services. So from end to end, MEC is actually there to provide uh, solutions to help optimize all your laboratory and workflow processes. So we say always curious, imagine the next 350 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Stanley, we now take over the question and answer session. Mr. Stanley. All right, thank you, Dr. Bukola. Um, Dr. Ilona, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. The first one is coming from Adewonuola, Adebinkwe. And uh, the question says, what will be your limit of detection slash quantification for calculating your total chromatographic impurities? What will be your limit of detection slash quantification yeah for calculating your total chromatographic impurities? Yeah, that's a very good question, I think. Thank you for that. Um, actually, it's not very easy to answer because, uh, of course, the limit of detection would be uh, very much depending on the material itself, on, on the, of the compound itself, and uh, also uh, from the de detection method and so on. So uh, one thing is that um, uh, you can find in compendial methods information and of course the validation process includes also these um, values. So I cannot give a general answer if there is any compound where you are especially interested please send it to me or send the colleagues and they will send it to me uh, and I will check for that to give you the answer. All right, thank you, Dr. Ilona. The second question is coming from uh, Patrick Lukuke and he says, are you saying that minimally the following tests must be done to develop a secondary standard? One, LOD, two, water, three, ROI, four, ROS, five organic impurities. Then uh, a question attached to that say, what is the difference between LOD and water analysis? Is water content not part of LOD? And then uh, the last one says, can the lab just compare chromatographic purity of the secondary material to primary standard in an HPLC method and calculate potency? Why is this not acceptable? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Patrick Lukolai. These are real questions for, from a, a chemist thinking with me at the presentation, and you are absolutely right. Uh, loss on drying and water, this is the same. I'm not sure why we, <laughs> why we listed that uh, separately in this uh, equ equation. You are doing uh, loss on drying or uh, Carfisher titration for water usually or any other method for the water determination, you are absolutely right. Um, this is the same. Um, actually, what you have to do for this uh, total mass balance method, you have to look for the inorganics, for the water, for the residual solvent and uh, for the organic impurities. So uh, the method, you can decide how you uh, you do that, uh, but but these are the compounds basically with what can be in your material, and this will give you the hundred percent. So that's an interesting question. Do you need that for uh, secondary standard? 
um, not necessarily. This is what we do. I mean, our secondary standards are CRMs. And CRM means that uh, we want to make sure we have traceability. Of course, we can have traceability to the pharma standard, as you mentioned on the, um, at the end of the question. And in most cases, this is good enough uh, for, for an in-house standard to qualify and, and use that. Um, we have this uh, mass balance method to be able to uh, calculate also the uncertainty of the content. This is one thing. Sometimes we don't have the pharma primary standard and uh, also even in that case, we want to have a certified reference material and then we need to do this um, um, mass balance method. And normally the primary pharma standards are uh, really connected to, um, to the compendium, so the method. And our CRMs you can eventually use also uh, for, for um, other methods because they are qualified also on this mass balance uh, methodology. So if you are doing a, an in-house standard, you just do the HPSC uh, comparison to the primary and uh, you calculate the potency. That's, uh, that's uh, absolutely the method what normally the labs are doing. Uh, what we offer, it's a little bit more an additional service and uh, sometimes it is also needed if you don't have a primary. I hope it answers the question. I hope so too. Uh, I guess if there is any other clarity to be given, uh, the question I let us know. All right. The next one is coming from Ezekiel Ibidapo. So, what is the relative cost of secondary standards when compared with primary standards? Ali, I think this is a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, um, the question here, I should know if, uh, and then I think I think there's also another question here relating to that. It says we engage in pharmaceutical analysis. How could Bloom Public Health and Merck help us in getting reference standards? Um, just let us know what uh, reference standards you need, and then uh, we can take it offline, and we can always make uh, these standards available to you locally here in Nigeria. And that is why MEC is collaborating with uh, Bloom Public Health to make this uh, program available so that you can understand that um, these kind of products are locally uh, accessible. Uh, then the question here again says, will participants receive a copy of this webinar? The answer to that question is yes. If you registered for the webinar, we have your email addresses we are going to be sending a copy of uh, the slides uh, to all the participants uh, in this uh, webinar. So I don't think we have any more questions here. Uh, if there are any other questions in the minds of the participants, please feel free to post them. We can always send the answers to you even after the webinar is over. Thank you very much, Dr. Bukola. Uh, okay, uh, there is one quick one here that says, will there be a track and trace platform when Bloom eventually starts supplying standards? A track and trace platform, definitely we will have that. Uh, we just don't, we are not traders, so we just don't do things anyhow. Uh, we want to know who you are. We want to know what your application uh, process is like. We want to know what you need the standards for. Uh, we want to understand all those things and then we make the standards available to you and then we also follow through to see that you actually have optimal uh, results from the analysis uh, you're doing. So this definitely will have to be done. Dr. Pukola, over to you at this time. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. All the participants, we are glad to have you in the house and uh, we know that as you know, that we're during this uh, webinar series, we're trying procedures. So for our next webinar series, we're considering chromatographic solutions 
to improve food safety. Chromatographic solutions to improve food safety by Dr. Patrick Apley. And uh, that will be in another two weeks. Before we go, we have our uh, proper feedback. Hopefully it's coming up now so that we can take the, fill the feedback form to know that yeah, we, we are getting the, the right information across to participants because this is what we stand for, Bloom Public Health and Mac Life Sciences. The pop-up please, the feedback form, the pop-up feedback form, please all participants try and fill this form. It's very, very important for us. We need to have the feedback. We need to know how we're doing. And we need to know that we are really meeting your ex expectations, you know. Thank you for filling it and make sure that you press the submit button. After picking whether we're doing excellently well, whether the, the, the webinars are meeting your expectations, are very good, good, fair. Thank you. So this is, uh, we take like two minutes for us to fill. So we hope to see you in another two weeks. And please, all these presentations, you can find them on our website, bloompublichealth.com, and all the social media. You can also find a full video of the pharmacy that we just um, presented a few minutes ago. You can find a full video at bloompublichealth.com and on all social media. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for allowing us into your space once again this week. In another two weeks, we expect to see you. Thank you. Bye.